UFOs have been a mystery for hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. They have been depicted in cave and rock carvings from as far back as 50,000 years ago on Aboriginal rock carvings. Skeptics have written them off as mass hysteria or weather anomalies, mistaken for something else. Hi, I'm Sean Stone. This film is about factual evidence filmed by NASA as early as the 1950s during supersonic test flights of the X-15 and throughout the Apollo and shuttle missions and currently through filmings made by the International Space Station. July 17, 1962, Edwards Air Force Base, California. Major Robert White, test pilot for the United States Air Force, strapped into the X-15. Attached to a specifically designed wing pylon, Major White and his X-15 were carried aloft by a modified MB-52 mothership. Taken to a launch altitude of 45,000 feet, the goal of this particular test flight was for Major White to take the X-15 higher than it had ever flown before. White rapidly accelerated to a top speed of Mach 4.8. After 81 seconds of powered flight, the XLR-99 engine exhausted its fuel supply and shut down leaving the X-15 to coast to a new FIA absolute altitude record for pilot and aircraft of 317,450 feet, 59.6 miles, or 96 kilometers above the Earth. This was the first X-15 flight to qualify the pilot for a United States Air Force astronaut rating. While his flight was at apogee and he was experiencing over three minutes of zero gravity, Major White was able to look out the left side window of his X-15 aircraft. Suddenly, Major White keyed his radio and made an excited transmission. There are things out there, there absolutely are. In the August 3rd, 1962 issue of Life magazine, Major White commented further about his UFO encounter while at the very edge of space. This was not the only UFO encounter filmed during the X-15 program. Several months earlier, during one of NASA test pilot Joseph Walker's X-15 flights, the camera systems captured what Walker would later describe as being five or six disc-shaped or cylindrical objects near his aircraft. On May 11, 1962, at the Second National Conference on the Peaceful Uses of Space Research in Seattle, Washington, Joseph Walker also claimed one of his mission objectives during his 1962 flights in the X-15 was to detect and film UFOs at high altitudes. During his lecture, Walker showed several photographs to the audience of these UFOs he captured on film, although NASA has since only ever made one of these frames public. I don't feel like speculating about them. All I know is what appeared on the film which was developed after the flight. The very first astronaut UFO sighting in space can actually be traced back to NASA's very first manned orbital mission, which took place in February 1962 during Project Mercury. That particular flight, which was designated as Mercury MA6, was flown by astronaut John Glenn, and during that three-orbit mission there was a well-publicized incident where Glenn reported seeing through the spacecraft window what he described as fireflies that were moving around outside his capsule while he was on orbit above the Earth. Uh, this is Friendship 7, I'll try to describe what I'm in here. Uh, I'm in a, a big mass of some very small particles uh, that are brilliantly lit up like they're luminescent. I never saw anything like it. They're around the little, they're coming by the capsule, uh, and they look like little stars, a whole shower of them coming by. Uh, they swirl around the capsule and go in front of the window, and they're all brilliantly lighted. Uh, they probably average maybe uh, seven or eight feet apart, but I can see them all down below me also. Uh, negative, negative. They're very slow. Uh, they're not going away from me more than maybe uh, uh, three or four miles per hour. They're going at the same speed I am approximately. They're only very slightly under my speed. Over. Uh, they do they do have a different motion though from me uh, because they swirl around the capsule and then depart uh, back the way that I am looking. Are you receiving over? There are literally thousands of them. Uh, this is friendship seven. Uh, am I in contact with anyone over? 
in an effort to minimize or debunk these fireflies, NASA has always officially claimed that what Glenn was seeing up there uh, was just tiny water droplets that must have been on the exterior skin of the spacecraft, which had then sublimated to ice in the near-vacuum orbital environment, and these ice crystals were then breaking loose and were floating free around his capsule. And if you blindly trust what NASA claims, and if you only examine certain select portions of the MA6 mission evidence that NASA directly highlights to support their hypothesis, then that official excuse may actually sound rather plausible. However, aboard each Mercury capsule was a black box audio tape recording system that was designed to record any verbal comments or descriptions that the astronaut might make during their flight. And when we examine the complete onboard commentary from John Glenn made during his MA6 mission, listening to the full real-time descriptions as he was actually observing these unidentified objects in space, it very quickly becomes clear that he was seeing some objects up there that absolutely were not ice particles emanating from his capsule. Uh, this is Friendship 7. All these little particles, there are thousands of them, and they're not coming from the capsule. There's something that's already up here. Because they're all over the sky, way out. I can see them uh, as far as I can see in each direction almost. Roger, Friendship 7. And during the Mercury MA-9 mission in May of 1963, astronaut Gordo Cooper also observed the fireflies outside his capsule and reported them to the ground via the radio. And while we unfortunately do not have the full audio transmissions from that flight to listen to, the NASA archives do contain the Mercury MA-9 composite air-to-ground and onboard voice tape transcriptions. And just as one example of this sanitizing, if you go to page 3-20 of the Mercury MA-9 mission transcript document in the NASA archives, you see that as soon as astronaut Gordo Cooper starts talking about the fireflies that he is seeing outside his spacecraft window, those particular comments have indeed been sanitized, with the asterisk marks denoting that specific descriptive commentary from Cooper was actually omitted from the official transcript. In this official NASA transcript for the Mercury MA-9 mission, NASA is blatantly admitting that they have engaged in selective editing, sanitizing the transcripts by removing comments from the public record entirely. In this case, very specific comments that clearly were related to the fireflies that Cooper was really seeing outside the window of his Mercury spacecraft. It's not a conspiracy theory that NASA did this transcript sanitizing, it's conspiracy fact. And the reason it was done was to obfuscate the truth in order to ensure that the public would only see certain select evidence that fit NASA's official cover story. They literally removed some of the truth about these fireflies from the public record by classifying those astronaut comments in the interest of national security.
an object which is in the same place all the time, but there is a deep tumbling. Well, we've had it ever since yesterday. It just seems to be tagging along with us. When it comes to unidentified objects that were filmed during the Apollo missions while the astronauts were in cislunar space or lunar orbit, nearly 400,000 kilometers away from the Earth, the skeptic argument that these things may just be man-made satellites that were already up there in lunar orbit loses credibility in a hurry, because we know from the official historical record that there were simply no known or declared American or Russian satellites orbiting the moon during any of the Apollo lunar missions that could possibly account for any of these objects caught on film. Uh, and NASA's official position is that the Apollo crews never saw and never were in a position to film any man-made satellites that were known to already be up there when they arrived in lunar orbit. Could these things be unmanned Russian probes sent to the moon, one of their unmanned lunar or Zon remote sensing platforms, for example? Again, no. The official historical record tells us what Russian equipment was up there and where it was throughout the duration of the Apollo program. Uh, during NASA's first manned lunar landing, Apollo 11, for example, we know the Soviets sent an unmanned lunar lander that was known as Luna 15 to the moon at the same time the Apollo 11 crew was up there. But we know from the orbital ephemeris data for Luna 15 and from NASA's own admission that the Apollo 11 crew were never in a position to see or film that or any other Soviet space probe in the vicinity of the moon. We know that the phenomenon of mass concentrations or mass cons on the moon, and these mass cons can dramatically interfere with the orbital stability of any man-made satellites that were put into lunar orbit. This mass con effect means that any free drifting satellites in lunar orbit were found to suffer faster than expected orbital degradation. So contrary to what many in the public may think, objects placed into low lunar orbit don't just stay in a stable orbit around the moon forever. Mass con effects eventually can cause the orbit of those satellites to degrade uh, until they just smack into the lunar surface and are destroyed. So you can look at the data for every single declared object ever injected into or released in lunar orbit by the USA or USSR prior to or during the Apollo program when these UFOs were being filmed. And the fact is, none of these anomalies filmed during the Apollo program can be ID'd as being known satellites that were already up there in lunar orbit. There simply was not a lot of man-made space junk in lunar orbit back during each of the Apollo missions. That argument seems to be a common skeptical assumption, but it's not supported by much official historical record evidence. These objects are UFOs. We don't know what these things are, where they came from, how they got there, where they're going, or what they're doing up there. These are true unidentified objects in the vicinity of the moon that were captured on film during Apollo. When STS-48 hit the airwaves, hundreds of thousands of people suddenly realized there were unidentified flying objects being filmed by NASA on the shuttle cameras. NASA's James Oberg, among many other debunkers, started claiming that these objects were nothing more than ice crystals. For the most part of his life, Martin Stubbs was a producer, working with Dick Clark Productions in the late 1960s. He produced, directed, shot, and edited many television programs over the course of 25 years. 
Stubbs' work would lead him to Shaw Cable in Vancouver. This gave him the opportunity to run the cable station, where he would soon make UFO history. Martin Stubbs was once from an artistic walk of life, but that all changed when a NASA video made it to the public eye. Martin Stubbs saw this and asked the cable owner if he could take one of the transponders and dedicate it to the live feeds from NASA's own satellite. He was granted a dish and Martin began downloading the transmissions NASA was blocking from the general public. Had it not been for Martin Stubbs, this incredible evidence of UFOs in outer space would never have surfaced and NASA would have continued covering up what they are doing and what is there just above the Earth. One of Stubbs' most compelling videos was the STS-75 footage of what was called the Tether Incident. What NASA was telling us they were doing was releasing a satellite at the end of this 12-mile long tether that would serve as a test to see if this energy-producing satellite could open up a new method of propulsion for shuttles to eliminate using fuel. If you look up the word tether in Merriam-Webster's dictionary, here's what the definition is. Tether a rope or chain that is used to tie an animal to a post, wall, etc., so that it will stay in a particular area. The tether satellite turns out to be a power generator, somewhat like a Tesla coil, producing a high voltage and being dragged through space and the plasma fields. This seems to have disrupted the balance of plasma in the upper atmosphere, and these critters, or animals that exist in the space, were affected. This is a fact of the matter. We were really not sure after John flew whether or not there were critters, living critters, out there somewhere. Critters that were captured by NASA on that mission STS-75 in 1996. In all my considerable experience of the entire UFO scenario, I have never seen 
and never expected to see footage like that. And least of all did I expect to see it on film that, or, or tape that had been exposed by the government in a NASA mission. The Shuttle Columbia in this mission was equipped with a very sophisticated and expensive ultraviolet camera. It was sensitive to the near ultraviolet. And when they were up at 300 miles above the atmosphere, they launched from the Columbia a small satellite with a tether. Not long after it was launched, the tether broke. We record steadily the whole uh, break and uh, coil back of the tether. Copy, Claude. Here we go. Again, this is a view of the satellite. Well, if it had to break, it did it in the right place. And you see on this astonishing film, you see the uh, satellite go drifting far astern of this orbiting Columbia. The tether, which is 12 miles long, straightens out into a long white line, which you can see as plainly as, as could be. Columbia and the satellite now 77 nautical miles apart. Now while this is all going on, a whole covey of UFOs, perhaps three dozen of them, manifest to this ultraviolet camera and they begin moving around, circulating, looking for all the world like something in an aquarium tank. The satellite, again uh, just moving into sunrise. Now Houston, of course, down on the ground, is getting this feed from from the Columbia, and they ask the astronauts in the shuttle, what can they see? What is it they, what is it they can see? You guys getting the image? Franklin, uh, we see a long line, a couple of star-like things, and a lot of things swimming in the foreground. Can you describe what you're seeing? Well, the long line is, uh, is a tether, um, and uh, there's a little bit of debris that uh, kind of flies with us. It is like a brilliant white bar. It looks like a neon sign. And it's 12 miles long. Now what this does is give you a sort of cosmic ruler by which you can get an idea and an estimate of the diameter of the UFOs that are flitting around down there. Now when you see them go behind the tether, that means that you can use that tether like a ruler to measure their diameter. And those things that are down there going behind the tether are between two and three nautical miles in diameter. Image stabilization with UFO tracking analysis reveals the flight paths of the objects swarming the tether. This process is courtesy of Kerry Martinek of Luna Cognito Productions. Applying object flight path and velocity tracking enables us to see the trajectories that these objects are traveling. There are at least five objects that are traveling alongside the tether. Many of these objects are traveling forward, coming to a complete stop, and then traveling back where they came from. The maneuvers that these objects are making take an enormous amount of energy. While all this is going on, the tether, the objects, and the shuttle are all orbiting Earth at velocities of at least 17,500 miles per hour. 
The objects are being recorded in the infrared and ultraviolet light spectrums, which means they are invisible to the naked eye. One of the things you see over and over again is you see UFOs materialize into the ultraviolet while you watch. You see them come from out of nowhere to the point where they are returning a response to the camera. You also see them dematerialize while you, while you have them under observation. There's two of the central things that have gone on with UFOs since day one, materialization and dematerialization. It's going on in this film, 300 miles above the Earth, photographed by your government with your astronauts superintending the whole thing. Charlie, completely unzoomed, and uh, you see the full extent of the tether. Plummy Houston, that's a much better view, uh, a lot more contrast. This film proves our government has known about UFOs and that they have been filming and monitoring them since at least the early 1950s. By viewing this film, you now have at your fingertips a way to find out more about Earth and what exists just a few hundred miles above us and in the farthest reaches of outer space. We wish to acknowledge Martin Stubbs for opening the window of truth about UFOs from outer space. My name is Mike Barra, and basically I've had a fascination with space and aliens and UFOs and things since um, as long as I can remember, since I was a little kid. In the 1960s, uh, I was just, you know, four, five, six years old, and I remember watching the, the, the rocket launches on TV, the Gemini missions, the Apollo missions, and I remember always thinking that there was something that they weren't showing us, that there was a greater mystery to the whole thing than we were being allowed to see on TV. And I don't know where that thought came from or why it was embedded in me, but it just, it always was. I can distinctly remember the Apollo uh, 11 moon landing when, you know, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon for the first time in, in human history, or at least in this version of humanity's history. And I remember thinking, you know, why is this just some crappy black and white picture? Why isn't it color? We had a color TV in my home. We were lucky in those days. And, and I asked my dad, who was an engineer at Boeing, you know, why, why don't they have it in color? Why is it just this really terrible black and white TV picture? And he said, well, you know, I really don't know because the distance involved doesn't make that much difference. The TV signal's still gonna be strong enough. So he didn't know the answer. And, and that shocked me because my dad always knew the answer to engineering and technical questions like that. And it, it really stirred my curiosity. And it, it got me thinking more and more that there was more to NASA and the space program and what was out there than we were being told. And it really reinforced that, that inherent belief that I feel like I was almost born with. So then, you know, things progressed. We went to Mars. The Viking missions happened. I just distinctly remember the face on Mars uh, when it was first a big shock in the newspaper that this thing looked like a, a human head on the surface of Mars. And I remember the whole controversy, and they said, oh, well, you know, we took another picture a couple of hours later, and it all just went away. It was just a trick of light and shadow, and that was the official position within NASA. And it Gosh, it had to be 15 years after that that I started reading about the face on Mars, and I found out that that claim by NASA was totally untrue, that the fact was that it was nighttime on Mars, and they couldn't have taken another picture a few hours later. And sure enough, when they did find a second picture, it looked even more like a face than it had initially. So I began to look at this stuff on Mars and work that was being done by other people in the field like like Richard C. Hoagland and saying to myself, you know, I like this because unlike UFOs and abductions and, and videos of bright lights in the sky and stuff, this is something that I feel like I could actually sink my teeth into, that I could actually test, that we could get more pictures and we could see what this thing really was and determine whether or not it was artificial. And eventually all that happened. I mean, we got picture after picture after picture of the face on Mars. NASA continued to insist that it was absolutely of no interest to them, yet it's the most photographed piece of real estate on the planet Mars. And, you know, if they're not interested in it, why do they keep taking pictures of the thing? The whole ancient aliens thing took off, and I started looking at ancient aliens on Mars and ancient aliens on the moon. There's definitely artificial structures on the moon, there's definitely artificial structures on Mars, and even the little rovers as they drive around the, the Martian surface, they keep finding stuff that looks like, I don't know, mechanical equipment. Uh, I'm, I'm an 
I'm a mechanical engineer and I can certainly tell, you know, a cased metal object when I see one. And I can certainly tell when I see mechanical flywheels and gears and something that looks like Captain Kirk's phaser that he dropped on the surface. Uh, I can recognize all these things as mechanical implements. And so it became really obvious to me that there absolutely was solid evidence that somebody had lived on Mars before. And whether they were human or completely alien, I don't know the answer to that. And I don't know that anybody ever will, but it seems like it seems like human architecture and it seems like human mechanical design. So it it may be related to this this idea that the Hopi have that there have been progressive worlds of man and that we've gotten very advanced in some of them and that the last one was even more advanced than we are today and, and maybe they went to Mars and built some of these pyramids and built some of this equipment and left it behind and it's all eroded and stuff now but to me um, I just kept getting reinforced by this and then you start asking other questions like if there are ruins on another planet on Mars if there are ruins on the moon that definitely can be described as artificial that engineers can recognize as as you know instrumentalities v different vehicles different mechanical implements uh, air conditioners <laughs> things like that then you say to yourself well okay if there was a prior civilization living on these planets then there could have been a whole bunch of them and then that begins to reinforce to me the idea that Maybe all these stories of alien abduction and alien contact aren't so crazy. So I was very lucky. I've been lucky enough to have worked for uh, some, some major television networks, and I've worked on a couple different shows, Ancient Aliens being one of them. Um, I got to do a show called Uncovering Aliens for the, uh, the Discovery Networks. And that was really interesting because they cast me as the skeptic, which actually fit me really well. Because even though I believe that all this stuff is real, I don't really lock into that until I got all my questions answered. So I became the guy that would ask all the questions on the show. And, you know, I've, I've certainly known people who've been abducted. Or I've known people who had these experiences. But when I started meeting them kind of at random for the show and they started describing what had happened to them and these intruders in their rooms at night and the things that they did, I, as I was questioning these individuals, I realized, you know, they're not crazy. Because the reality is that we can't ignore this anymore. We cannot ignore visitations in our bedrooms. We cannot ignore UFOs in our skies. And we absolutely cannot ignore UFOs in outer space. Hello, my name is Laura Magdalene Eisenhower. I am the great granddaughter of President Eisenhower. And all throughout my life, I've had a lot of interesting experiences that helped me to be very open to the idea that there is other life in this universe. And what really kick-started uh, my research was a lot of the rumors that I saw about Eisenhower in ET government treaties. When I was young, I had contact experience. I also experienced a recruitment to Mars in 2006, which helped me to understand what's going on behind the scenes. So as I've been working to connect the dots, I have had a lot of revelations and epiphanies about how the light and dark operate and what our role is as a humanity to be prepared for what's to come.
Putting these images to music do not do justice to what they contain. I urge everyone to go to MarsMoonSpace.com and check out the videos starring Neville Thompson, Martin Graney, Billy Carson, Rami Bar Ilan, Linda McClendon, Rory O'Brien, Brett Collins Shepard, and hosted by Thomas Mikey Jensen in order to get a full grasp of what's going on in these images. The important discoveries made by these researchers need to be seen and heard. I am fortunate to have found them for my film, and I thank them deeply for their work. In 2001, I was checking one of NASA's websites uh, featuring photography taken by the Mars Odyssey mission. And in a few of the photos, I found a UFO that appeared in different locations on Mars. Different terrains, this UFO appears. And it's the same shape, same kind of design, but um, it's definitely in the air over these certain areas on Mars. So here they are. Our sun is 93 million miles from Earth. To give you an idea as to the size of our sun when compared to Earth and the other planets in our immediate solar system, I have situated the sun in the middle and put each planet on the side so you have an easy scale to size comparison. Starting with Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and so on, Jupiter being the largest of all planets is still dwarfed by the sun's immense size. The SOHO program, known as the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, is comprised of two cameras situated on either side of the sun in deep space. These two cameras allow NASA to capture film and photography in stereo, and when seen together, give them the depth of 3D. In 2001, I had seen early footage of anomalies appearing near the sun and passing by it, flying into it, and on several occasions, firing at it you could see what appeared to be laser beams shot into the sun, and the reaction of impact showed a tremendous amount of explosions. In or around 2007 or 2008, it came to my attention that things were seen orbiting the sun in hundreds of photographs. Once I heard about this, I immediately went to the SOHO website. I began downloading hundreds of these photographs. There were so many that in the space of a few days, I had compiled about 400 photos. There would have been more, but I got busy working on my films. 
figuring that someday I would do a segment or documentary on these sunships, as they've been called. There are now many researchers in the world finding, compiling, and presenting these sunships on YouTube and other websites. For this film, I am including some of the most spectacular photos taken by NASA of these anomalous objects and submitted by researchers. I have looked through the many photos I downloaded in 2008, and some of the latest photography that reveals these sunships are still orbiting the sun and doing whatever it is they're doing. There are literally thousands of photographs posted daily on the website. There are hundreds of UFOs showing up near the sun. I'm including some of the most spectacular shots of UFOs.
In 2012, I came across a video that interested me right away. It was called Giant Space Cables and was being presented by a YouTube channel called Universal Trek. I was immediately taken by these gigantic space cables, where they came from, who built them, where they go, and what they are being used for. The amazing cables came from nowhere and while scrolling downward, upward, and to all sides where these cables can be seen, there is no real explanation as to their origins and whatever happened to them. Thankfully these videos were produced and made public by Universal Trek, and here they are. The mysterious space cables located in deep space. Looking at these space cables and the distances they go into deep space, they are perhaps millions of miles in length.
Looking at the space cables, I can only wonder, who made them? What other purpose? Where do they go to? Who is traveling through them? Are there giant people using them? Are we using them? Where do they start? Where do they end? Will we ever learn about them? And where are they now? Because I have not been able to find them recently. So there you have it, the gigantic space cables stretching out for millions of miles in deep space in either direction. Uh, there is no origin to where they come from and no ending to where they stop. They are just continuing to stretch in deep space for millions of miles. These videos are from 2012. I have written Universal Trek asking if they have newer information or images of these cables and have not heard back from them as of the making of this film. I myself went on Google Earth in space looking for these cables and although I did find some tube-like structures in deeper space, I still haven't found the original space cables presented in 2012. I don't know if they've been deleted from Google Earth or where they might now be found. After watching this film, if you have any information about these space cables, please contact me by emailing me at jose at tblnfilms.com. What you are about to see is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is the most ambitious astronomical survey ever undertaken, a detailed sky map. It generates positions and basic characteristics of space objects. From the nearest, most impressive star located near Earth, we move to other things that are even farther away and larger than our own sun. These motherships, as some are being called, are so far away and so large that one person made a comment, there is one or more of these that are the size of the distance between Mars and Earth, if not larger. And these objects are coming our way. When you go to the sky map, you will get the main landing page. You have two main tools, the zoom tool and the search field. When you type in the coordinates such as 0506, 30.72 and minus 88, 10, 29.4, you will see a small square appear where this object is located on the sky map. Then you zoom in and soon you will see the object that is located in these coordinates. The zoom tool, by the way, is backwards. Pull it downward in order to zoom in. Going up will make it zoom out. You can pause the film to be able to type these coordinates into the search field on the sky map. These results will deliver you some pretty amazing objects located in deep space. I will call out the coordinates in the next objects and show you the photos of what you are going to see. 
1444-22.14 minus 83-2906.0. These are four objects. 16-4050.46 minus 82-34-21.9. This is a rod-shaped object. 192637.47 minus 8301.35.9. This is a circular object. 2017.54.94 minus 8303.36.2. Vectors. These are vector objects. 02516.05 minus 84.1229.5. This is a worm shaped object. 0451 Two one dot five six minus eighty four zero zero four nine point one. This is an object that's shaped like a shuttle. One zero zero nine two zero dot nine one minus eighty five one thirty dot zero seven. This is a bright disk. Once you get used to it, you can start searching for new objects yourself. You will be amazed at what is out there. I firmly believe that if, if the proof of extraterrestrial life was put forth today, 
uh, the, the effect would, would not be nearly as, as catastrophic as they predicted it would be back in the 1950s. The world is a very different place today. Uh, this kind of comes into the once you start lying, though, you, you kind of got to keep lying. Um, and the lie gets deeper and deeper. And that's, in many ways, it seems that's what they've kind of dug themselves into. Um, but in terms of benefiting mankind, uh, we're talking about the covering up of hyper-advanced technology that could do away with fossil fuels, uh, our dependence on fossil fuels. Um, we're talking about uh, technology that allows for much quicker transport through space than, than we've ever been told. Um, we're talking about technology that could benefit mankind in ways that we really don't even know as the general public because of how deep this goes. Some of the individuals that I've talked to have, have discussed uh, military technology being not 5 or 10 or 15 years ahead of what the public perceives state of the art to be, but to being 100 years ahead, 200 years ahead, more than that. And if you believe that the United States of America did acquire alien technology and was reverse engineering it and is reverse engineering it. Um, if they're sitting on this stuff, why aren't we privy to it? Uh, the interest of national security argument, I don't know if that, that holds any water anymore. Maybe it did at the dawn of the Cold War. They could have got away with that argument and they could justify that. Because I have had an overwhelming amount of new discoveries in Mars photographs by independent photo researchers, there are too many incredible discoveries that must be seen and compiled for everyone to enjoy. I am ending UFOs from Outer Space with this last segment. It should leave you with a lasting impression that there are things in space and on Mars. Thank you for tuning in to my film.
what do I think people are going to take away from this? Um, I'm hoping it's going to open up some people's eyes to the fact that things are not as you've been told they were. Um, and just as importantly, to open your eyes to the fact of really how wondrous it is. There, as deep as the lies go, the fact is that the truth is, is an amazing bit of subject matter to even begin to try and dig into and uncover. You're dealing with such incredible, is, is really the only word that you can use to describe it. It is incredible subject matter. It is literally out of this world. And there is so little that we know. There is so little that we have been told. But the truth is out there.
There are many mysteries in our universe. The images and films you have just seen are only a small amount that have been discovered by Jose Escamilla and many of the researchers who have contributed to this film. This is Laura Magdalene Eisenhower. Thank you so much for tuning in. Maybe their path is blocked. Maybe they found their path is a dead end. And now they're here trying to get something from us, maybe through our DNA or through some sort of spiritual interaction, that they need to move forward. By viewing this film, you now have at your fingertips a way to find out more about Earth and in the farthest reaches of outer space. This is Sean Stone. Thank you for joining us in Outer Space. Thank you.